You know, it's funny, when I was 30, I thought I was really, really old. I thought my life was over. I was going through a decline, and uh, it wasn't until I think I was 45 when I first found, which completely changed my, my body. Welcome to the Seamland Podcast. I'm your host, Seamland, and our guest today is Dave Pascoe. Dave is the 61-year-old guy who beat Brian Johnson at the Rejuvenation Olympics and became an overnight sensation online. I recently made a video outlining Dave's routine, but he also agreed to come to my podcast to talk about his story. Dave, welcome to the show. Hey, Seem, it's great to be here. Really nice to meet you. Yeah, and uh, you accepted my invitation to the podcast after I made uh, a video about uh, your routine, and many people were also excited to uh, you know have you on the podcast because yeah, a lot of people are interested in what you're doing for your longevity and uh, just yeah, uh, getting great results with it. So I guess we can start with. How did Dave Pascoe become this uh, famous person, famous man who ages slower than Brian Johnson or has a slower speed of speed of aging than Brian Johnson and uh, kind of also become yeah like a small celebrity in uh, the longevity space? <laughs> well, I was going to say it takes one to know one because I think you're beating all of us right now, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, well, I'm not actually I'm not the number one anymore. Or I've seen actually quite a lot of people who... Uh, have like 0 0.56 and even like below that so wow. <laughs> so where yeah there's wow. a, a lot of these uh, i guess um you know not public people who have also like very good results <laughs> i'm just amazed to be getting any attention whatsoever just for living my normal life it's kind of weird yeah but how, how did it uh happen so like you uploaded you took the test i would imagine and then you kind of was surprised about the results yeah, I didn't even know anything about the competition when I originally found True Diagnostic. I really was just using them to validate my progress to see that, yeah, you know, what I'm doing, am I on the right path, basically. Mm. And so, yeah, I just happened to have my third epigenetic age test and pace of aging test when I found out that there was a competition. And I was looking at my results and I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, this this can't be right. Am I truly beating this guy? This This can't be. So I submitted my results thinking, well, you know, they're going to come back and tell me you're misinterpreting these results. You're definitely not beating Brian Johnson. Um, or I was beating Brian and then I'd be really curious to see if they were going to post my results or not. But to mm. their credit, they did. So I was very impressed. Mm. So like you did three tests and the third one was like you uh, figured out that it was actually like an amazing result. Or what What was like your three tests then? Like what, what scores did you get? Gosh. Uh, shoot, I was just looking at this the other day, so I should know this. I think my first one was about like maybe 0 0.78. Mm. I think my next one was, well, it depends because there was somehow they, they tested me twice, like the mm. same sample. Okay. And it came, once it came back 0 0.77 and another time it came back 0 0.8. Okay. But then my third was 0 0.66. I want to take a quick break to announce you that you can now pre-order my new book, The Longevity Leap. The Longevity Leap is an evidence-based guide to slowing down biological aging and adding healthy years to your life. The book contains 24 chapters ranging from the biology of aging to nutrition, fitness and supplements. I also cover over 50 of the most clinically relevant biomarkers that you need to think about when it comes to longevity. Everything you need to know about longevity is in this book. As a bonus for the pre-order, you'll also get an additional bonus chapter as a PDF about skin longevity and reversing skin aging. And you'll also get another bonus chapter about my personal routines for longevity. If you want to pre-order the book for a discount, then check out the link in the description or head over to thelongevityleap.com. Yeah, how did you get into just trying to take care of your health in the first place? Like, what's the backstory? Well, you know, I was always kind of a weird kid. I, um, I always had a lot of crazy questions. At least I was told they were crazy. Um, and I could never get any good answers from anybody in my family for these questions. So, um, I started looking to the people around me, the adults around me, and I, I wanted to know what made people successful, whether it was financially, relationship-wise, or you know even health. And I started noticing that the people that were very successful at finances or relationships or health always did the same things. And the people that were terribly unsuccessful generally followed the same patterns too. So from that early age, I just wanted to do what the successful people did because I just thought that made more sense. If you can choose your life path, why not? 
why not? Mm. You know, success leaves clues, as Tony Robbins likes to uh, to say, quoting Jim Rohn. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. Like you know, there's there's been like you know billions of people before us. And uh, we like to think we're somehow special, or <laughs> and there's of course be, there's of course been this you know transformation in society and technology over the past you know a hundred years even, but uh, I guess I guess still some of the framework and the principles are still the same when it comes to yeah like health and fitness and finance sleep, and relationships, sleep, and... nutrition, you know, exercise, the basics. Mm. You know, the basics are still the best. I think they're the biggest movers. Mm, right so you were you were never like any with particular medical condition or sick or obese or anything like that well I, I did have a bit of a scare back in 2012 i was just turning 50 mm. and uh it's, it's nothing serious so i mean I, when i say a scare it was a scare to me i don't think any any other people would have blinked an eye at it but um i was training for my first marathon i was doing p90x and i was taking care of both of my parents who were you know, battling cancer. And I heard about a test for telomeres. And I thought, huh, that sounds interesting. I wonder, I wonder what my telomeres would be like. You know, I thought it was Joe Cool, Mr. Athletic. And I figured, oh yeah, my telomeres are going to come back and say, you know, I'm about 20, 23 years old. No, I was shocked. When my results came back, they said I had the telomeres of a 68-year-old at mm. age 50. And that that puzzled the heck out of me. I knew right then and there that obviously I was missing something really big. I just didn't know what it was. And that forced me to do a deep dive then at that point, you know, looking into everything I could about, you know, cellular aging, cellular biology. Um, yeah, I mean, longevity was not something that was on my radar prior to that. Mm. But knowing that I was aging faster than I thought I should be, or the tests said I should be, was a huge shock. Mm. I think right. that was the biggest driver for me. Mm. Yeah. Well, that was like 12 years ago then. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's and interesting. I, I, yeah. I took, uh, with, along with the test, they offered a consultation with a staff physician. So naturally I called because I wanted to hear what they had to say. And I was really surprised that they started off the, the call asking me questions about my lifestyle. Mm. At, at that point in time, I don't know if it was widely known that lifestyle really had a big effect. You know, most people thought it was genetics that drove everything and that you, you know, they were your destiny. You didn't really have any kind of say in the matter. Uh, at least for me at that point in my life, I was not aware that lifestyle had anything to do with anything. I mean, I guess I did. I should say that. I mean, as a kid, like I said, I, I did the things that all the successful people did. So to that degree, I did know lifestyle had a lot to do with it. But the questions they asked me and, and my answers surprised both them and me because as soon as i started explaining that you know my job was incredibly stressful i'm taking care of both of my parents um you know doing the p90x i'm doing marathon training they're like whoa 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 stop stop right there you are killing yourself with stress mm. they said we've seen we've seen long or short telomeres with endurance athletes we've seen it with caretakers of elderly parents We've seen it with people with really stressful jobs, but you've got the trifecta. I mean, you've got pretty much everything going on. Mm. And so they suggested that I get back into, I, I start doing things like yoga, uh, meditation. And, and that kind of surprised me because I used to do those things. And somehow life got in the way and I totally forgot about them. They took a back seat. Mm. So I had to focus on those a little bit more, take a little more uh, rest time, recovery time with the P90X and the marathon training so that I wasn't just beating myself to death. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like too much, even of the good stuff <laughs> can uh, eventually yeah. be harmful. And, uh, yeah, with telomeres, it's interesting. Like, uh, I, I, I guess like the current understanding of telomeres is also that what matters more is like the, the speed at which they shorten. So shorter shortened uh, telomeres are like a risk factor for some of these chronic diseases or they're more like a sign that yes you might be under some like increased burden or stress uh, but like i guess the re relative values themselves are more like subjective and it's hard to yeah like you know with a single test it's more matters about okay like 
how fast are they declining? So you might, you know, there might be genetically that you might have just longer telomeres or shorter telomeres. So what, but yeah, like ideally it would be to see, okay, how fast are they, you know, shortening within the span of, you know, a few years. So like, have you done like any subsequent tests with the telomeres or how has it like changed? I have, I've done, um, I know true diagnostic gives a measure, uh, the company that I was using, which was called Tello years is, is defunct now. So they're no longer, mm. no longer around. Um, life length is another company that I've been using. Um, and I really wanted to get a good measure lately, but due to some lab issues, they, I got somebody else's results. So I'm okay. still trying to work through that with right. them. Yeah. A little frustrated by that. Um, yeah, because I'm not 70 years old. So that was like, eh, this is not my results. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, but from the results that I have gotten, I have seen my telomeres have lengthened. Okay. And I think the last measure was um, probably about a 54 year old, even though right mm -hmm. now I'm going to be 62 here in August. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah, it makes more sense. And yeah, kind of goes to show the power of uh, lifestyle or, uh, that it also goes to show that you know if you have done short term short term damage to your body, then you can still like uh, recover from it, and at least based on this marker and you know other markers as well, like you can improve some of your other metabolic parameters. You can improve your fitness status again. You can improve your body composition. So yeah, like a lot of you know there's a some some things that people or the scientists think that are irreversible, but most of the things are still like reversible in terms of actually like functional outcomes and like at least you can reverse some of the risk factors for a lot of these other chronic diseases that uh, you know end up killing most people like the problem in the modern world is that most people die before they reach their genetic potential for uh for you know how long they could live so you're like they might get a heart attack in their 70s or something even though they might have the genetic genetic potential to live to age of 110, they just get cut short because of this poor lifestyle that yeah. gives them a heart attack in their 70s. So, yeah, like we all have our obviously some genetic limits, but the lifestyle is still going to be like a huge bottleneck in like determining, you know, how how far you're going to end up going. You know, it's funny when I was 30, I thought I was really, really old. I thought my life was over. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I just thought it was. I was going through a decline and uh, it wasn't until I think I was 45 when I first found P90X, hmm. uh, which completely changed my, my body, uh, my body appearance, gave me some great confidence. Um, but I was also changing up my lifestyle, you know, prior to that. And, and at age 50, I, I was so much more healthy, fit, energetic, vibrant. Uh, my, my abilities were so much greater than they were at 30 mm. that i started getting excited about getting older in mm. fact now almost 62 i think i'm even better than i was at 50 so mm. i'm i'm super excited about getting older and i'm like yeah come on bring it on <laughs> what do you got for me let's yeah. see yeah it's yeah, so all like you're like actually improving with age and you're wiser at the same time so we know who knows with the, what you know the, the next decades there's some, uh, you know, medical procedures and uh, technologies that actually, yeah, like still extend this youthfulness for even longer. And uh, you can still enjoy this kind of a independence, physical and uh, cognitive independence for, you know, into your 90s and 100s. Yeah. And you know what they say? They say like, you know, half of what we think we know turns out to be wrong. We just don't know what half. Mm. So, I mean, who's to say the things that I'm doing today that I assume are correct? Um, may not be found out later to not be the right things <laughs> like they were 20 years ago or 10 years ago, right? Like are eggs healthy or not? You know? uh, yeah. All the crazy things that, you know, fat, fat's bad for you. You know, all those things that we used to believe I, I followed because mm. that was the belief of the day. I wonder how much of what I'm doing now we're going to yeah. find out is, is not yeah. right. Yeah. I also noticed there's like, everything goes in circles, you know, because like low carb diets weren't they're not like a new thing you know atkins was the first kind of famous uh low carb dietitian so you know that, when was that like in the 80s or something i don't know i wasn't even born yet but <laughs> but you know there was already in the 80s low low carb then there was like in the early 2010s was 
paleo kind of uh, movement, then the paleo died off around 2016. Then keto became until 2020 or something, then keto died off slightly or it became much less popular. Now there's a carnivore diet that is more popular. So like everything kind of goes in trends. There's nothing like, at least in the diet world, there's not a lot of new things being <laughs> invented or, you know, I think with, with the diet and like exercise, at least it still comes down to that, you know, eat a relatively balanced diet. You don't have to have any like crazy diets. Uh, you know, yes, sugar is bad, but uh, you know, you don't need to be like super insane about it uh, either. So it kind of comes down to like the balance and uh, with exercise, there are like, yeah, with exercise, it becomes more like mature over time. Although I've seen that it's not just cardio or just weights, you know, in the seventies and eighties, it was just cardio. Then in the early 2000s, it was mostly weights and the early 2010s it was also mostly weights. And now it's become like, okay, you need to do both actually, <laughs> which is just like over time you become the, the kind of field has become more mature with the, the exercise components, at least with the diet. I think I feel it's still pretty like dogmatic and tribalistic <laughs> and hopefully like in the next few years, the diet diet sphere also becomes like more coherent or yeah, like mature with, uh, the kind of ideas. And now you got to throw hit work into the mix too. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so exercise is kind of, yeah, you need to do everything almost, pretty but much. let's, but let's talk about, yeah, like. I made a video about it pretty thoroughly about your diet and supplements and workout routines, but you know, let's hear from you yourself. So like, what are some of the like fundamentals that uh, you do? Like many people are interested in like your diet and supplements and exercise. Well, I got to tell you, and I wanted to thank you too for your video, because, uh, you know, when I first saw it, I thought, oh no, this is going to, this is going to be a takedown. <laughs> so I was bracing myself for like, oh gosh, you know, how, how badly am I going to get destroyed here? Um, but your your video was like was really um, respectful and uh, very thorough, and I actually learned some good things from it. Um, I made some changes to my supplementation thanks to your suggestions, your recommendations. So thank you for that. I really appreciate <laughs> that. Um, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> I've yeah, well, well, let's take like you know you mentioned exercise and P ninety X. So uh, yeah, like I I think many people might know it, what but uh, what it is like, how does it look like, and uh, yeah, what exercise oh, you do. Yeah. Besides that, yeah. Well, P90X was something from, um, gosh, yeah, I would have discovered it in 2008. I think it was probably, it probably came out maybe around 2006. Um, it's a combination of weight bearing exercises, uh, like every other day, with cardio in between and in the in between days. So the cardio things may be, um, you might be doing Kempo karate one day, you might be doing plyometrics the next. Um, you might be doing, uh, extreme yoga another day. So like some pretty interesting stuff. You're constantly switching up, uh, body parts and basically working every muscle that you have. And I know a lot of people stop or quit two weeks into P90X because it is so extreme and you end up super sore. Mm. Um, but I always tell people, if you can stick with it through that two weeks, you'll get through the soreness and then you're, you're home free. Again, because you're hitting every muscle and most muscles you don't even realize you have until you start exercising them in a program like that. Mm. Yeah. So it's like a, some sort of a hit, uh, workout protocol. Or... Yeah. It pretty much covers everything. Right. Uh, some of the days you'll have just and back other days you'll have, uh, back and biceps, um, shoulders, tries, and, um, ab work every other day. Mm. Right. Yeah, I was, I was very impressed by it. Prior to that, I used to be the guy in the gym that would walk around with a clipboard, going from machine to machine, recording the the weight and the number of reps that I did, so that I could mm. validate that I was improving from week to week. Mm. You know, but I never really saw any change in my body composition from that until P90X. Okay. Well, that's super interesting. So, like, you, you more like in the past, you did more this traditional fitness or bodybuilding approach. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Have, have you noticed like with, with, uh, with the decades, um, have you noticed like, does your body respond differently or have, have you like had to adjust some of the workouts with, with age now in your sixties, for example? Yeah, I noticed, uh, gosh, it was right around the time I hit 55. It was starting to take me longer than an hour to do an hour P90X workout. 
Mm. And I just assumed, okay, you know, this is it. You're, you're getting older you know, your energy starting to drop off. It's just the way it is, which I was not, not very happy with that answer, but I was starting to accept that when I heard on a podcast, um, about, uh, NAD supplementation and uh, a product called, uh, true niogen or mm. NR nicotinamide riboside. And I thought, huh, well, it's worth a shot. I mean, I pretty much try everything. I, I'm a constant experimenter. So I ordered it and I tried it. And uh, again, I'm a skeptic on everything too. Like when I first started P90X, I, I thought it was just marketing hype. So I didn't really expect anything to happen. And it did. So the same with True Niagen. When I started taking the NR supplement, I was expecting nothing. And I didn't notice anything um, just in my day to day going about the house doing doing work. But it was probably two days after I started it, I did my next P90X workout and I couldn't believe I got through the hour workout in the hour and I had more energy left over. So I did a whole nother hour workout right after that. Mm -hmm. I'm like, this stuff is amazing. Um, so I didn't realize that at, at my age, I guess my NAD was really dropping off and supplementing that made a huge difference. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Whereas I think when I was 30, I, I did try an NAD plus supplement. Mm. Um, I found it in GNC and thought I'd just give it a shot. It did absolutely nothing for me, but that makes sense. Cause in my thirties, I probably had my NAD was just fine. So in your thirties, so that was, that was like in the nineties or mid nineties. Yeah. Was it like heard of it? Nobody was even <laughs> talking about it. I just happened to find it as a supplement and thought, eh, I'll try this. Oh, really? But it was found. Was it was it was it NMN or NR or or, or was it actual NAD itself or NADH? It was ah like as okay, yeah. Well, yeah. it might. I think it might might not be as like bioavailable than than NR or NMN. But yeah, it's interesting that you're like not the first person that I've heard who say that they started taking NR or NMN and then they got like some sort of a second wind with their like endurance and uh, just they were able to exercise for hours, uh, et cetera. So yeah, it, it's, I think it's certainly very like individual in, in some sense. Like I, I don't notice a lot of <laughs> when I take it, like uh, I might take it sometimes if I'm getting like short sleep, then I do notice it. Maybe it helps with uh, like the alertness or helps with uh, the sleep recovery. Uh, but yeah, like a lot of times I, I don't notice it that much, which yeah, probably makes sense that like my energy levels should be like, you know, I'm 30 pretty much right now uh, as well. And, uh, you know, if you didn't notice it in your 30s, so it makes sense why I don't notice it right now either. <laughs> Have you ever taken uh, an NAD test like Genfinity's or Do Not Ages tests? Yeah, I did uh, a few years ago. It was like it was like in the range somewhere in the middle so yeah it wasn't like uh, deficient in in any way um yeah it's interesting yeah i figured at your age you probably wouldn't need it you probably in optimal range already yeah pr well probably that would make sense like um i don't have any like so like if you have like some sort of yeah like with age is probably one of the things that can increase the demand and there's also like other things like you know I guess like poor metabolic health and uh, jet lag and uh, sleep deprivation, those things will also deplete it. And, you know, I do, you know, occasionally if I'm like traveling cr across the ocean to US or India or wh whatever, then I do notice that uh, the NAD uh, does help a little bit because, of, because it's also linked to the circadian rhythms as a like a metabolite. So it helps to like realign the circadian rhythms a bit better. Yeah. I was, uh, was away in Italy for 30 days and I mm. completely changed my entire lifestyle, um, eating, sleeping, my diet, especially because I'm, I'm usually very low carb. I don't normally do sugar and mm. I don't normally do caffeine, but there I was high carb, high sugar, high caffeine. Yeah. And, uh, I did a, I do a blood test every month and I did one the day I came home and I, I you know, I expected that my markers were going to be out of whack, but I was very surprised that my hormones were crazy out of whack. And mm. that was probably more from the jet lag, you know, the plane travel and lack of sleep, but my yeah. testosterone was almost non-existent. Oh, wow. It was a huge shock. Yeah. So, retested a couple of weeks later and saw that it was, you know, coming, coming back again, but yeah, you know, it was a huge eye opener. 
Yeah, well, Italy and Spain are yeah, pretty interesting that, you know, they do a lot of the, the opposite of what, you know, healthy people would expect to do, like, at least yeah. like in the US or other uh, Western European countries, like, you know, they uh, stay up late, they drink wine, they eat pasta, <laughs> they don't they exercise don't like that. dinner until 9, 9.30. <laughs> yeah, and they still have like, you know, well, Spain and Italy are like number five and number six or something uh, in the life expectancy in the world. So, you know, maybe it's the sunlight, maybe it's the olive oil, maybe it's the fish or something else. <laughs> All the above. Yeah. Well, their food quality is amazing. I mm. mean, they cook everything from scratch. I took two yeah. cooking classes while I was there and I couldn't believe how easy it was to make your own pasta. Mm. Then just good, clean ingredients, not, you know, all the preservatives and the food coloring and, you know, things like yeah. we put in our food here in the States. It's, it's mm. kind of disgusting actually, but yeah, there in Italy, yeah. everything was made fresh just before you ate it. So it was terrific. Yeah. yeah and, uh, and in Italy, like you can eat a pizza and, you know, it's, it's a healthy food there because it's made of sourdough, uh, sourdough, sourdough, uh, as the dough and, uh, you know, you have fresh tomatoes and uh, some, uh, you know, other clean ingredients and stuff like that. But yeah, like when I first went to US in 2018, I landed in LA and uh, immediately like the first people, even the security guards were like 32 BMI. And I was like, wow, this is a completely different yeah. place than, you know, coming from Europe where everyone was like, you know, relatively skinny compared to US. So it's yeah, pretty pretty drastic uh, kind of difference in the environment uh, as well. Yeah, I like to say I fell in love almost every day in Italy. So. <laughs> right. Uh, but what about uh, your diet then as well? So like, what do you eat at home? What's your like regular uh, diet like? So one of the things that I changed, do, you know, between my uh, third or second and third epigenetic age test, the pace of aging test was my diet. Because I was in the process of working on remodeling my house at the time, so I was not eating um, food that I make like I do now. I was, uh, you know, ordering a couple of pizzas, and I would have a few slices for lunch or a few slices for dinner in between working on things. Um, now, though, I I pretty much make everything that I eat. Um, I grow a lot of my own food now too, but um, yeah, so. I know I've got everything listed on my website. In case people are interested, they can they can look for it there. But I will do. Um, I would do eat meat. I do um, grass fed meat from butcher box, um, free range chicken, uh, Alaskan wild caught salmon. But most of the the meat that I eat, and even if it's um, you know sardines or um, mackerel or clams, oysters, it's it's very small quantities. Like I'm, I'm basically doing, I guess what you'd call a condiment of my meat. The majority of my, my meal is, it's more vegetables. I'll do fruit. Um, but yeah, large, really large salads. Mm. So mostly plants with some meat. Right. Yeah. You had some, uh, nice salad recipe. I saw that you had like, I guess like almost a dozen different types of herbs and, uh, greens in there Is i would that... i would put more in there too if i could find them at my local grocery store but right. we're limited what we could get here so do you do you like batch it or or do you like uh, just every time you do the same do. like recipe i do i'll i'll have like a food prep day usually sunday where i'll make an enormous salad that will last me the week um the same with um like i'll, I'll make mushrooms I'll, I'll cook some rice i'll do some um acorn squash um yeah I'll, I'll usually batch those things up so i've got those that i can pull out and eat quickly because I'm, I'm basically lazy i like to do things as efficiently as possible but then you know when i'm busy throughout the week i don't want to spend a lot of time you know cooking and preparing things so it's really nice just to be able to pull stuff out mm, yeah for sure, yeah, I understand uh, the appeal to that. Like, I I only eat like mostly once a day, so it's easy for me to do it like uh, on the go with that. But yeah, at least uh, for the for the uh, busier people and average people, I definitely yeah, I would think it's a smart idea to at least have like larger, you know, meals ready made, and then you just heat them up and uh, you can eat it. 
it makes it much better. Like you're able, you're, you'll be able to stick to it much more easily through the dot. And it's the same with my chia nut berry bowl. I like to make mm. a large quantity of that and I can freeze half of it and pull that out later. Mm. Yeah. And what, what about like, I guess like your calorie intake or something like that. So like Brian Johnson, he had this uh, lower calorie diet. You mentioned on your website that you're not doing any calorie restriction deliberately. So uh, yeah, like have you ever counted your calories or any like guesstimates about that? No. No, I just, I eat as much as I like. In fact, my friends make fun of me when I go out to restaurants. I usually order two meals. Mm. (laughs) Yeah. Like when I go to like Ford's Garage, which is like one of my favorite restaurants locally, I will get this huge berries and gorgonzola salad with shrimp. And that's a meal in itself. I mean, it's, it's, it's enormous. Mm. And I will devour that first. And then after that, I'll order a a mushroom Swiss burger with avocado and an egg sunny side up. And I'll devour that too. (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah that's what i usually do as well if if i go out to the restaurant with my wife then i usually order uh, like one main course and then like a few sides because you know if i'm coming there without having eaten much <laughs> the day before or the, the entire day then you know yeah. this restaurant restaurant portions already are pretty like small as well or smaller than you would normally eat at home so you kind of need to uh, fill it up a bit more um, a lot of the time I get busy, so I skip lunch. So I'll basically just have breakfast and a huge dinner, gotcha. which is why I like to eat around 3 or 4 p.m. That way I've you know completely digested everything by the time I go to bed. And mm-hmm. I've noticed big differences in my sleep scores when I do that. Mm-hmm. So I stop like a few hours before bed too. Yeah. Have you, have you done any other like fasting or anything like that? I have. Um, I, I do like to pick maybe one or two days a month where I'll, I'll just go on a complete fast for the day just to mix things up. And I used to do, um, if you're familiar with Prolon, it's a five day fast mimicking diet. Yeah. I used to do that quite a bit. Um, I had to stop because I'm, I'm too lean now. I don't have enough fat to burn. So when I do that, I lose right. muscle, which mm-hmm. sucks, but I did do a five day fast immediately after returning from Italy. Cause I, I had some, you know, some nice, belly fat going there from all the carbs and i wanted that gone quickly so yeah that did the trick right so you're like i guess you're adjusting your food intake based on like your leanness and uh, like yeah how you're feeling at the moment yeah Mm. well somewhat (laughs) i mean i i still eat like a pig i i I stuff myself with salads and it's (laughs) so uh, I feel full, but it's probably not a huge amount of calories. Right. So I don't know. Maybe I actually do live caloric restricted and I just don't know it. Um, I just, it's not anything that I do intentionally. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Yeah. But you, yeah. Yeah. It's hard to know. Yeah. Like, you know, because the, there's a huge distortion between how many calories we think we're eating and how many calories we're actually eating. So yeah, like even like the professional, I guess, like dietitians and, you know, professional weight loss people, even they don't know exactly how many calories something is uh, unless they actually weigh it. So yeah, there's a, always like some, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30% uh, difference uh, between uh, the like expected intake and the actual uh, intake. But, you know, I don't think it matters like that much. Yeah, like what matters more is, yeah, the, you know, the act what's in the mirror and what's in the, in the blood, <laughs> in the blood work. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh-huh. I agree. Uh, so you, uh, I think you, if I remember correctly, you had on the website uh, your testosterone res- results as well, uh, which were like very good, like super high. And uh, uh, yeah, can you talk about uh, that? Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm surprised and maybe a little disappointed by how quickly people go to testosterone replacement therapy. Because mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of things that we can do about that prior to just jumping straight to you know, replacing T. Mm. Uh, for instance, um, you know, I noticed that my DEHA and my pregnenolone, uh, when I do my blood tests, was low. So I started supplementing with both of those. And of course, those are those are upstream regulators of testosterone. They they yeah, you know, they convert downstream to testosterone and estrogen. Um, and so I noticed, you know, a big jump 
in my testosterone levels just by supplementing those upstream precursors. I, I think there's so many people that could benefit by trying that rather than just jumping straight to the testosterone replacement. Right. And then I also noticed that when I was doing my uh, training for my marathon training or even half marathon training, just getting out and running increased my testosterone. Mm, wow. It just there's so many simple things that we can try before yeah. just jumping to replacement. Yeah, sleeping and vitamin D and uh, sunlight. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, exactly. All of the above. Yeah. Yeah, and DHA levels also go down uh, with age in both men and women as well. So it yeah, does uh, contribute to the low testosterone in, in the process as well. But yeah, like a lot of people, at least in the, in the video comments that I made, they said that you're, you, you must be taking some like TRT or some peptides and those kind of things. <laughs> <laughs> Nope. And I, I will do things like uh, Tonga Ali and right. uh, what else am I taking? <laughs> boron, uh, maybe. If I'm yeah, listening. boron. I was doing boron more for at the re, um, rec not the request, but the suggestion of my cardiologist um, known as America's Healthy Heart Doc, Dr. Joel Kahn. Um, there were good studies on um, heart health with boron. So that's why I was supplementing it. But yeah, there's so many things that help and contribute. It all it all works together. Mm. But I was doing the um, like stinging nettle and the Tongat Ali mainly to address uh, DHT to try to keep that lower because I like to keep my hair. Mm. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> Vanity, you know, I always get you. <laughs> um, maybe let's talk about the the supplements then. And uh, in the video, you were taking uh, like over a hundred supplements uh before at least on the website it's so more uh, now thanks to you but <laughs> <laughs> so yeah like we can talk about so what are you taking right now then like what's the, the latest uh updates oh my gosh you want me to go through 180 uh, some uh, <laughs> well not not all, but i mean what what are what are like some of, the, some of the highlights obviously you don't need to mention all of the all of the ones like this like some antioxidants you don't need to mention those but okay. no other like yeah highlights um alpha keto glutarate is one um i'm doing tam 818 and ta65 specifically for to address my shorter telomeres um i do several supplements just to address my eye health because um doing my full genome i found that i have three genetic markers for the same macular degeneration that my dad suffered from so i'm doing things like you know uh, zeaxanthin lutein astaxanthin um and of course, eating a lot of, you know, a carotenoid rich foods, you know, lots of reds and yellows and oranges, and orange colors, things like that. Um, trying to think of what else might be notable in my supplements. Because I truly do take a lot. Um, <laughs> there was some, some of these like the telomerase uh, or tel telomere supplements that you you had in the video, at least. Yeah, that would be the TAM 818 and the TA65. Okay. Oh, and then uh, I think uh, Gatu Cola, I think, is another one that's supposed to increase telomerase. I just learned about that one recently. So I'm uh, adding that as a powder into my uh, my drinks when I drink, mix my drinks in the morning. Mm, nice. Gotcha. And uh, what, are, what do you think are like, what are the things that you notice that work the most? So yeah, like one of the, I guess my, one of my main uh, things I pointed out in my, my my video was that you know you hard it's hard to know which ones work and th that's the same like uh, thing I pointed out f f to Brian Johnson as well that he you know, he takes so many supplements it's like virtually impossible for him to have split split tested all of them and to know okay what does it actually do and uh, and stuff so you know he he might rely on like some clinical evidence um, from studies that it does that but you know it's it's not like that he's also like representative of the subjects in those clinical uh, studies. So like a lot of the supplements might be done on people who have some sort of metabolic disorder or some, you know, metabolic uh, disease. So yeah, it's hard to know if it actually works for him. And so like, what do you think, have you noticed some of the supplements like actually working or? Well, so I have a, I have a, an odd theory about all of this. Um, when you take a look at somebody like Julie Gibson Clark, who is on the Rejuvenation Olympics leaderboard, 
Um, she's doing amazing and she's not taking a whole bunch of supplements. I mean, I think her pace of aging is slower than mine and Brian's. Well, maybe not Brian's now that he's done the follistatin gene therapy, but um, mm. just slightly under his. I think he's 0.64 now, and I think she was 0.65. Mm. So, I mean, that's pretty darn close for somebody that doesn't do a bunch of supplements, hasn't had gene therapy, um, and really just focuses on the basics. I think the basics are really the key to slower pace of aging. And I could have a genetic age, you know, getting the right sleep, getting great exercise, sweating a lot, um, and clean nutrition, making your own food. You know, don't eat, not eating processed foods or things coming out of a box or a bag. Yeah. So when you look at, uh, now I've heard this from the folks at True Diagnostic and some of their podcasts, and at least this is, this was my understanding that those numbers, that test, is specifically designed to give you um, an accurate age, completely independent of disease status. And so what that means is, you know, originally when they started these um, aging clocks, they wanted to be able to say, you know, age the DNA of a cadaver to be able to determine how old it was. And you couldn't have things confounding that age like heart disease or high you know high blood pressure diabetes liver or kidney disease you know so it was specifically designed not to take those things into consideration mm. so you can have a very slow pace of aging and a good epigenetic age but still have a major disease which to me was sort of eye opening right and that's why i focus on the sleep the diet and the exercise for the cellular level of control or benefit that they do give. But then I look at supplements to take care of the organ systems, the higher level functioning within the body to address things like heart health, eye health, liver health, things like if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah it does. Like, and uh, yeah, I kind of like it or. Uh... I, I might agree with it to a certain extent. Of course, like the fundamentals are also good for the organs and the eyes and the heart, sure. etc. Sure. But yeah, like the supplements aren't going to move the needle on a like a on like I guess, I guess like on this epigenetic level or uh, on like yeah like the deeper level. They're more like they might you know adjust your biomarkers to a certain extent, and they can adjust some of the risk factors for some of these chronic diseases. Yeah, but they're not going to like yeah fundamentally affect your epigenetics the same way like exercise or your diet or like sleep are uh, going to do. So yeah, right. in that in that sense, yeah, like it makes sense that you're just uh, using them as for for like yeah like this is some minor and yeah like even then like you know we don't have supplements that are <laughs> that powerful and that they're going to yeah like give you maybe like you know one to two percent maybe five percent at most. In terms of the the results, and the the vast majority comes from exercise, and you know, you know I wish we had those pills or these uh, drugs <laughs> for uh, <laughs> longevity. You know, every everyone would take them, but uh, yeah, like right now, what what matters the most ap appears to be just the exercise, the diet, uh, sleep, circadian rhythms, and managing stress, and uh, that is going to just reduce your risk of these chronic diseases and uh, epigenetically slow down the, the your biological aging as well and and then you know at least that's what the that's what Brian thinks as well that you know in 20 20 years or something like that will we will have these drugs that dramatically extend your lifespan so you just need to stay alive until that point <laughs> until those drugs come into into like uh, availability I guess it's possible I know my yeah. parents wanted a pill because you know they they didn't exercise. They didn't eat right. They smoked. They drank. Mm. A pill would have been so much easier rather than having to change your daily day to day activities. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like uh, most people will want to take the pill <laughs> rather than exercise, but yeah, like there's nothing that is as powerful as as exercise. Uh, yeah, right. Not right now. And I'm also like a bit less, I guess, uh, optimistic about it that we will have this massive rejuvenation technologies because you know it's 
it's uh, it's hard to imagine how it would look like, uh, given the fact that right now we don't have anything that is you know, nearly as nearly as good as exercise <laughs> in terms of the th therapeutics and stuff. So yeah, like we're yeah. kind of looking at a we don't even know where to look, kind of almost uh, in some sense. Yeah, I don't think there's ever going to be a pill to replace exercise because I mean, you think about it, exercise is you know the only thing that removes cellular waste or lymph is you know muscle move, movement massage exercise mm -hmm. sweating i don't think you're ever going to find a pill that's going to be able to to do that yeah i think that's always going to be important mm. right um so uh you also mentioned that you're like retired on the website so uh what has what has your like yeah what how, how has your like routines changed in some sense given you're not working anymore so do you have more time to take care of your health or do you have more time for relaxation or what's yeah what's what are you doing like then uh, nowadays surprisingly it didn't work the way i expected it would uh -huh. uh, i thought that i was going to have all kinds of extra time to do things but i think that while i was working i was far more regimented on things because i had to be you know, you have like eight hours of the day that were allotted to work. And then you, to do anything else, you really had to schedule and, and be very diligent about getting those things done. Um, now with my time being more free form, um, some of that discipline has fallen off. I hate to say, mm -hmm. um, but a lot of that had to do with, um, this new direction my life has taken because of the rejuvenation Olympics, um, you know, interviews, podcasts, um, creating a website, you know, all of that just took my time and attention in a completely different direction. Mm. So um, I'm hoping as things kind of calm down and settle down, I'll be able to focus again more on things like, I mean, I had my entire genome sequenced, so I've got this mountain of data there mm. that I really want to dive deep into and, and examine. But mm. that's going to take a lot of a lot of spare time, which I haven't had lately. Yeah. Plus, I've been doing a lot of travel again, Italy. I went to uh, Dave Asprey's biohacking conference um, in Dallas a few weeks ago. Mm. I went to uh, Las Vegas for exosome treatment, like in my shoulder. That was what last weekend, two weekends ago. Mm. So yeah, yeah I've, had, I've had more time to do a lot of extra things, but not necessarily to focus as much as I would like mm. back on my routines and the supplementation and and the core of what I was doing before. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, like one thing that I I think you will not lose is probably yeah, like your sense of uh, purpose or some sort of uh, mission or goals, uh, mm -hmm. because you know yeah, like like you said, you're like diving deep into your own health and longevity now after uh, retirement. So you have this kind of new thing you're working on, <laughs> which is your your own uh, personal health, and yeah. I think you know that's what that was that, that's like the best thing uh, ever to have like your entire like attention be able to do uh, dedicate on uh, on on just that and uh, enjoy that uh, process at the same time because you know when you look at the studies and if people you know lose their sense of purpose uh, and uh, they you know lose some sort of meaning then that's also where their like risk of uh, dying also increases uh, a lot so yeah just having this sense of a uh, purpose or a thing or project whatever it is to work on kind of keeps humans motivated and kind of inspired uh, to live as well yeah i totally agree you know a few years ago um i actually got a concussion on a roller coaster mm. part of my usefulness was always to go to a roller park on my birthday and each year i would come home from riding the coasters with a with a kind of a headache and the headache would last me a few hours and i kept thinking well you know this probably isn't so good for my brain having all this jostling around at high speeds and quick stops and starts and yeah well so two years ago the very last ride at the roller coaster the roller coaster stopped fast and i felt like my brain went smashing into the front of my skull and the entire vision went down to this tiny little dot and came zooming back and my friends were having to pull me off the roller coaster because I just wasn't, wasn't quite with it. And I found out I had got a concussion. And so I found since the concussion that my balance has not been as good as it used to be. 
So now I'm trying to focus on a lot of things to improve my balance. Like I have a slack line in my backyard now. Um, I have a BOSU ball in my den that I play with. I think these things are important for longevity anyway, just to have a really good sense of balance because, you know, who knows when you're 90 some years old and you're naturally going to be a little more frail. If you take a fall, it's going to be a serious thing. Yeah. Definitely don't want that to happen to me. So I like to focus a lot on balance and stretching to stay supple. Mm. If you fall and you're stiff, you're going to strain something, you know, pull a muscle or break a bone probably more likely than you would if you were flexible enough where you fall and you can just roll and tumble with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. That's a very underrated. Yeah. Like just, you know, with age, you might stiffen up and you, your posture goes worse and uh, you're more rigid. So yeah, it's important to like stretch and uh, be flexible and mobile, not just strong and fast and uh, that kind of thing. Yeah. That's one of the things I just hear lacking in, mm. in the talk about longevity. People just don't okay. give stretching enough credit. Yeah. So you, you stretched every day, right? Yeah. It's usually one of the first things I do when I wake up, I'm, even while I'm still in bed, you know, I'll have my P PEMF mat going and then I'm stretching my legs up over my head, trying to stretch my lower back out and, uh, mm. and my thighs and my quads. And, uh, is that, is that a, like the inversion table behind you or? Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah. that's another nice thing about, um, having habits. You know, I've, some of the criti critiques I've gotten about my routines are, oh, that's a lot. You know, how do you do all that stuff? Mm -hmm. Well, if you make it so that you have to trip over things on your way to the bathroom, um, right. it's very easy to remember to do them. Yeah. So just off camera, I've got my, uh, little trampoline that's there. So, you know, after I get out of bed and I stretch, I'll, I'll do some bouncing on the trampoline and, you know, that generally gets the, uh, the bowels moving. So, um, I know some people do coffee for that, but the trampoline seems to work wonders for me. Um, that, you know, do the, um, the inversion table for five minutes while I'm looking at my phone upside down or listening to a podcast, mm. you know, things right. like the, the habit stacking makes routines just automatic. I don't even have to think about them. It's just part of my everyday. Yeah. And you know, what you don't use, you lose. So like if your house was a, uh, you know, uh, obstacle course, <laughs> then you would maintain this functionality for a lot longer as well, because you're just kind of forced to do it. And yeah, if, you know, the average house is that you don't, it's kind of flat surface everywhere, you have chairs everywhere, you uh, have doors and, you know, all those things are, there's no challenges in the environment, then uh, yeah, you like, your body will regress in terms of the I guess the capacity with uh, movements. So like, yeah, of course, very few people will turn their house into an actual obstacle course. <laughs> Some people will probably do it, but you know, we still like our comfort, but you know, the comfort is fine. It's more about, you know, you j then just have to be deliberate about adding those uh, challenges to your life, whether that be doing hit cardio. So like we don't have to run away after our prey uh, animals anymore. So you would, you have to do the hit cardio on the treadmill or in the woods or whatever, wherever. And the same with strength, like, you know, we don't need to lift carcasses and we don't need to lift firewood and boulders and stuff like that to survive. So we just need to do it with barbells and, uh, or resistance, resistance fans or whatever it is. So yeah, we just need to add this artificial strain, stress or strenuous activity to our life. Uh, because yeah, unless we do it, well, if you don't do it, then the body will just uh, regress and uh, yeah, deteriorate. Yeah, we don't have to club a mate over the head and throw them <laughs> over our shoulder anymore. It's just <laughs> yeah. it's a lost art. Yeah. Uh, one thing I was I wanted to ask was like, what what do you think about in the future? Will you do regarding like any of these new rejuvenation technologies or peptides or whatever things? Like, uh, have you thought about doing some of those things in the future or? Yeah, what are your like feelings about that? Yeah, it's a matter of affordability. Um, you know, so I've seen in the biohacking community a lot of people are doing the follistatin gene therapy. Right, uh, it's not really something I can afford. Uh, I did look into the full body stem cell makeover because mm -hmm. I know Dave Asprey and Ben Greenfield did that. Um, I think multiple times each. When they first did it, I think it was back 2018, 2019. I looked into it at the same clinic they went to. And the price was around $30,000, right. which 
was no small sum for me. I, it's not something I could just you know whip out and do that a little too much. Um, but I looked into it again recently because I just assumed that you know with the prevalence of stem cell therapy that that price would have come down drastically. But instead, it did just the opposite. It's it's around sixty five to eighty five thousand dollars now for the same therapy. Yeah. So they just keep pricing it out of my reach. I don't know if I'll ever actually be able to afford that. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. Yeah, like you know, because the argument is that over time they're going to be cheaper or more affordable. But yeah, I guess the, it might increase because that technologies or the treatments themselves become more advanced or more effective so they're bound to become more costly because they become more effective or whatever the reason is uh, so yeah i guess it's still right now is for sure like yeah uh, only like the wealthiest people will generally be able to afford all the all the things like all the all the stem cells and uh, gene therapies and stuff like that but yeah who yeah, knows like maybe phoresis you know plasma phoresis costs 10 grand to have that done in a yeah. clinic yeah and that's not even getting young blood that's just you know swapping out your plasma for albumin mm. so i do it on the cheap I'll, I'll go to plasma donation places and you know donate my plasma for free mm. so it's kind of the same thing it just takes longer and it's not as convenient but they pay mm. me which i think is wonderful <laughs> yeah and then i take the money that i get from that and i pay that into doing hyperbaric treatments so <laughs> one pays for the other yeah yeah like I guess that's the blood it must be it's pretty underrated as well i think uh, blood donations or plasma donations uh, just you know you get paid and it actually has quite interesting uh, benefits what have you noticed anything uh in your blood work or in how you feel or anything of like that after doing it consistently um i wish i could say that i have um, i was not doing those things prior to getting on the rejuvenation olympics leaderboard mm. but i did do another true diagnostic test after doing those and i didn't see any any needle move at all from doing those but i look at it like uh changing the oil in your car i mean mm. you can go forever without changing the oil in your car and it seems like your car is working just fine until it doesn't mm. right yeah because it bogs down under all the, the gunk that gets built up and all the waste so I look at you know offloading your plasma the same way because there's so many um, junk proteins that build up that you know if you get rid of them you're going to function a whole lot better your system's mm. going to be better. Yeah, yeah, and, and and it's another example of you know ancestrally or in the past you would have gotten scratched somehow like you know fighting an animal or or climbing a cliff or falling down or whatever and uh, or in war like it's pretty common to get injured. Uh, so you're regularly losing the blood, at least for, for you know, women use it, lose it as well regularly during menstruation. But, you know, men nowadays, you know, unless you have a physical or some sort of uh, labor, uh, then, or if you are, you know, combat, uh, re some in a combat job, then uh, you're not going to lose the blood either on a regular basis. So, yeah, you need to artificially kind of promote that circulation somehow. <laughs> Yeah, and whole blood donations are a really good way to do that. But yeah. you know, you can only get rid of two pints of blood, you know, at a time, and there's much much smaller amount of plasma in that. Whereas if you're donating plasma, you get your red blood cells back again, so you can even donate twice a week if you want. Mm. Right. Nice. So, what are your plans right now? So uh, you're retired. You're uh, super, I guess, motivated and interested in the. Uh, longevity uh, game so what are your like future plans what's your game plan yeah i mean i really just want to enjoy life more um a little fly flying in here um spending more time with friends i've been doing a lot more concerts um, hoping to do more travel um, doing more conferences uh, i know rad fest is coming up here um, i missed the health optimization summit in london that would have been really fun but i understand that they're coming here uh, I think in Austin in April. Mm. So um, attending more conferences, just socializing more, volunteering more time, yeah. having fun. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, it's fun to do longevity stuff, but uh, you should not lose the side of actually enjoying the life uh, as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I but do enjoy the, we, I, I think, you know, we both enjoy doing these things, uh, exercising and 
checking our genome and stuff like that we like we kind of enjoy it so it's half half or it's like you know double the fun almost <laughs> exactly i mean now i can just go out for a run whenever i feel like it you know whereas mm -hmm. before i had to do it during certain hours so that i was still available for conference calls at work mm -hmm. things like that now i can go in the sauna whenever i want i can watch netflix or i can meditate and um the time is mine now and i yeah. love that do you have any plans to like share more of your journey with uh you know like i think you will have like a lot of new people who would follow you online and track your stuff oh absolutely yeah i've been uh i i probably shouldn't say this because i'll get a flood of uh dms but people that have dm'd me so far i usually write back to so I've, I've kept pretty busy just conversing with various people that have had questions in fact their questions have fueled a lot of the um q and a that i have i've got a a page on my website with a lot of the q a that i get from people and when i get the same question more than once it goes on to the page so mm -hmm. nice people i know gotcha yeah i think a lot of people will because yeah like you know doing this in your 60s and you know uh getting great results that's uh, yeah inspiring for a lot of people and you know when you look at some of these people in there or who are like this 100 year old sprinter or stuff like that then uh yeah it's it makes makes peop, the average person also more like, hey, this is you know pretty common for uh, someone in their you know a hundred years of age to be super fit and uh, you know run <laughs> sixty meter sprints and stuff like that. So yeah, it's just you know more motivational for a lot of people to see it, and they just want to kind of uh, follow along uh, to that, that journey. And I think that kind of stuff could be the norm. Mm. I just don't think that people realize that they're still capable. You know, we get told that as we age, we need to slow down. We need to yeah. you know, take things easy. Got to worry about hurting yourself. You know, and people take that real serious. They uh, they sit more often than than not. And then, like you mentioned before, if you don't use it, you lose it. So the more that we sit and aren't out doing things, the more that we find we can't get up and do things. It's a self fulfilling prophecy. So as long as you stay active and keep moving, you'll be able to stay active and keep moving yeah for sure uh well it's been great talking with you and before i ask my last question uh, where can people find you and uh, your work so my website is uh, davepasco.net and i'm found on instagram under dave.pasco cool and um, my last question is what's this uh, one piece of advice or a habit that you wish you adopted sooner mm. wow um I'm going to change that a little bit, if that's okay, because it is something I did adopt sooner, but I wish more people would do. And that's if, for the young folks, if you guys are looking to live long, like 120 years or beyond, you need to be able to fund that. And you're not going to want to work forever. So if you have the ability to invest in a financial plan, like, I don't know, like, Different countries have different plans, but here in the States, we have 401ks and IRAs. Investing in that while you're still young, compounding interest is your friend. Mm. You know, you'll be able to be a millionaire by the time you retire easily, and then you'll be able to afford all those really good you know, longevity hacks, all the new cool stuff that comes out. But if you don't start putting money away while you're young, you're not going to have it down the road. So mm. invest. Yeah. That's that's my big advice to young folks. <laughs> yeah, and what you said in the beginning that you know you you follow what as uh, other successful people have done in the past, so just follow the exactly. the footsteps. <laughs> yeah. Success leaves clues. Yeah. So. Well, it was uh, amazing to talk with you, and yeah, definitely, I hope a lot of people, and I'm sure a lot of people will, you know, check out your stuff in the future as well. Cool. Thank you for this. This was fun. All right, that's it for this episode. If you liked it, then make sure you subscribe and follow us on social media. You can also pre-order my new book, The Longevity Leap, at thelongevityleap.com.